Hello and welcome to High Performance Culture Methods. My name is Aaron and today's sport we are speaking of football. Firstly, we're going to run through our client. They are age 31, male, played at county level. Their position is a right wing. They weigh 9 stone 5 pounds, which is 60 kg, and they are 5 foot 8 inches. Their primary focus is to improve running speed, kicking power and overall strength. Energy demands. It is predominantly aerobic activities, which is 90% of total energy consumption, with intermittent amounts of anaerobic activity in the form of kicking, rapid acceleration, sprints, turns, jumps, and tackles. Bangs Bolt, 2002. The average work intensity is close to the anaerobic threshold, measured as a percentage of maximal heart rate. Stolen, Kamara, Kastanga, and Wisloff, 2005. Variables such as heart rate are approximately 70% of maximal oxygen uptake, which is VO2 max, with energy production approximately 720 calories in a 90 minute game for a person weighing what Tom does, which is 60 kg, with a VO2 max of 54 milliliters per kg per minute. Bangs Bow, 2002. Lactate concentration averages 3 to 9 millimetres, to which individuals can frequently exceed 10 millimetres during match play. As with any action lasting longer than 10 seconds, the kicker uses a purely anaerobic metabolic pathway to produce the necessary energy to kick, which is ATP PC. Powers and Howler, 1997. Biomechanical. The stretch shortening cycle occurs during the kicking action to which the quadriceps contracts eccentrically. This is due to knee flexion as the thigh moves forwards from hip extension to hip flexion. As the forwards motion continues, the stretch shortening cycle occurs and the knee begins to extend through concentric contraction of the quadriceps. Lees et al. 2010. Anderson 1999 found that when wanting to increase ball velocity, it can be achieved by either increasing foot velocity or by having more mass in the lower limb. On impacts, the foot is usually abducted passively, inverted and plantar flex with the ability to produce up to 2,800 newtons of force. Shinkai Nanome Ikigame Isokawa, 2008. Nutritional Demands on training on match days, additional carbohydrates are needed, which results in increasing energy storage. Additional proteins are also needed after power training. This results in increasing the recovery of the muscles and preventing muscle aches. This is said by Ricardison, Dawson, Russell, 2017. Common Injuries a study in 2004 by Arneson et al. found that 12% to 28% of all injuries are due to foul play or contact with another player. 26 to 59% of injuries are due to non-contact. This occurs mainly during running, turning and incorrect warm-ups. 20% to 25% of injuries are due to re-injuries on the same type and location. This results in between 9 to 34% of all injuries during the season are classified as overuse injuries. Power exercises were prescribed due to them being a highly skilled movement and its high demands on the central nervous system. Fleck et al. 2003. Simmons et al. 2005 established that elite football players should perform explosive power exercises such as power cleans year round in order to maintain explosive power and maintain correct form. Power cleans. This exercise consists of quickly and forcefully pulling the bar from the floor to the front of the shoulders, all in one movement. Although the ascent consists of four phases, the upward movement of the bar occurs in one continuous motion without interruption. When performing the Olympic lifts, such as the power clean, upright posture is a main thing that needs to be maintained when performing them. Behind the head squat can be performed, which maintains the core exercises to stimulate strength and aid performance of assistance and power. Other exercises that can be done are deadlift and back squat. These can be chosen on the specific adaptations to impose demands. 
This is due to their correlation to running speed and jumping fitness components required during football. Fleck and Kremer, 2003. A power clean can be split up into three different phases. The first phase would be starting position. As you can see in the image, you would stand with feet placed between hip and shoulder width apart with the toes pointed slightly outwards. You would squat down with hips lower than shoulders and grasp the bar evenly with a pronated grip. Although, if the stronger grip is needed, then you can use a hook grip. You would place the hands on the bar slightly wider than shoulder width apart outside of the knees with the elbows fully extended and pointing out to the side. You would place the feet flat on the floor and position the bar approximately one inch, which is three centimeters, in front of the shins and over the bars of the feet. The position of the body would be with the back neutral or slightly arched, scapula depressed and retracted, the chest held up high and out, with the head in line with the vertebral column or slightly hyperextended. Shoulders are over or slightly in front of the bar and eyes focused straight ahead or slightly upwards. All repetitions would start from this position. Now we know what starting position we would get in. We're now going to speak about the first phase of the pull. So firstly, you would lift the bar off the floor by forcefully extending the hips and the knees. You would keep the torso to floor angle constant and do not let the hips rise before the shoulders. You would maintain a neutral spine position by keeping the elbows fully extended, pointing out to the sides and the shoulders over or slightly ahead of the bar. As the bar is raised, you would keep it as close to the shins as possible. The next part of the transition would be to, as the bar rises above the knees, you would thrust the hips forward and slightly flex the knees to move the thighs against and under the bar. You keep the back neutral or slightly arched and the elbows fully extended, point out to the sides. The second phase of the pull is still an upwards movement. You would rapidly extend the hips, knees and ankles, although it is important that the heels stay in contact with the floor for as long as possible in order to maximise force transference to the barbell. You would keep the bar as close to the body as possible, keep the back neutral and elbows pointing out to the sides. Keep the shoulders over the bar and the elbows extended as long as possible. When the lower body joints reach full extension, rapidly shrug the shoulders upwards with the elbows still fully extended and pointing to the sides. As the shoulders reach their highest elevation, flex the elbows to begin pulling the body under the bar. Due to the explosive nature of this phase, the torso is erect or slightly hyperextended, the head is tilted slightly back and the feet may lose contact with the floor. The third phase of the pull is an upward movement where the catch would happen. After the lower body has fully extended, pull the body under the bar and rotate the arms around and under the bar. You would simultaneously flex the hips and knees to quarter squat position. Once the arms are under the bar, lift the elbows to position the upper body, arms parallel to the floor. Rack the bar across the front of the clavicles and anterior deltoids. You would catch the bar with a nearly erect torso, the shoulders slightly ahead of the hips, a neutral head position and flat feet. After gaining control and balance, you would stand up by extending the hips and knees to fully erect position. The last part of the movement, you would lower the elbows to rack the bar from the anterior deltoids and clavicles, then slowly lower the bar down to the thighs. You would simultaneously flex the hips and knees to cushion the impact of the bar on the thighs. You would squat down with the elbows fully extended until the bar touches the floor or drop the bar to the platform if rubber bumper plates are being used. Warm up. Firstly, wrist circles were performed to reps of 10 and sets of 2. We then moved on to elbow circles. This was done in both directions. After elbow circles, seal swings were then performed. Then over and backs. Then freestyle bounce. 
We then moved on to arm circles. This was done in both directions. And then trunk rotations. As you can see in the video, he's twisted his trunk as well as his leg. We then moved on to hip circles. These were performed in both directions. Next was bow and bend. As you can see in the video, he was stretching all the way down and all the way up. Then it was knee circles in both directions. And then leg swings. This was done for both legs and for reps of 10. Then into the squatting ankle stretch. Each stretch was performed for 10 to 30 seconds on each ankle. Then we finished with the Russian baby maker. This was also performed for 10 to 30 seconds. grip put up in a straight line caught in the front deltoids and in the clavicles and then as you can see you would go down power up and then flick it back to the front of the thighs in the demonstration you can see three repetitions all kept with the scapula retracted and as explained in the step-by-step -step pictures Periodization. It is essential to establish the phase of training the athlete is entering in order to adequately predict the correct frequency of their training plan. The athlete is at the start of their in-season. During this time, is it suggested that two to three strength conditioning sessions a week is adequate for a trained individual? Kremer and Ratamest 2004. Due to the athlete having over one year experience of resistance training, they are considered as advanced. B click Earl 2008. Based upon this reasoning, two strength conditioning sessions per week is appropriate for this athlete. Although 48 hours are scheduled for the athlete between strength and conditioning training sessions to allow for natural recovery. As the development of maximal strength requires an optimal recovery interval of 36 to 48 hours between maximal strength training units whilst working on the same muscle group. Dick 2007 Repeated sprint training Firstly we did a jog of 1200 meters at easy to moderate pace. We then performed leg swings front, back and side. There was 10 reps performed on each leg with two sets after this we then performed hip circles the hip circles were performed with 10 reps going each direction and two sets was performed. We then went into forward lunges for 10 reps and then backward lunges for 10 reps and two sets. Followed on by inchworms, stretching all the way out and then going all the way up. Same as 10 repetitions were performed. We then went into high knee skips followed on by a 60 meter stride length run. Two sets were performed with a walking recoverer, Kovacs Limus 2013. As you can see in the video, there's the walking recoverer. 
After this, we then went in to do a 25 meter flying start sprint at a half pace. Four steps were performed with a walking recoverer. The pace then changed to a three quarter speed. Also with a walking recoverer. After this, the 20 meter flying start of a flat out sprint was then performed. This was also done with a recoverer. Three sets were performed. Car 1999. After the warm up, we then went into the main body. We then did a work to rest ratio of 1 to 4 with maximal efforts. IIA and Bangs Bolt 2010. There was 8 seconds sprints times through with a 30 seconds active recoverer. This can be seen in the video. Here you see Tom doing a 8 second sprint to which he covered just short of 60 meters. Here he is doing the 30 seconds active rest. Here he is doing his second attempt to which was consistent and also covered 60 meters once the active recovery was performed he then did his third attempt. Welcome to change of direction training. This will be done firstly with a jog of 800 meters to easy to moderate pace. This was used on the track to which you would do four laps because the track is 200 meters. We then moved on to leg swings on both legs. We did 10 reps and two sets. This was done forwards and backwards to the sides. Hip circles was then performed After this we did forwards lunges and then backwards lunges Then we went into inchworms Once inchworms were performed we then went into high knee walks and skips. We then went into a stride length run. This was for 60 meters for two sets with a walking recoverer. Kovacs Limus 2013. We then went into a half sprint for a 25 meters flying start. We did four sets with a walking recovery. And then same again, we then went up to a three quarter speed with a walking recovery. We then did 20 meters with a flat out sprint.
also with a walking recovery. This was performed three times, all with a walking recovery. We then moved on to the deceleration drill. The aim was to stop within five steps. As you can see in the video, Tom started off a little bit shaky and as he progressed, he then managed to stop with an athletic stance. After this, he was stopping a lot more better with athletic stance in there. The aim was then to stop within three steps, stop on the strong foot and then change direction. The Z drill was performed to enhance agility skills. This was done by performing 2 times 4 trials with 30 seconds between reps, with also 2 minutes between sets. You would alternate from left to right, as seen in the video. Crabbing from left to right, sprinting to the diagonal, crabbing and then jogging backwards can also be seen in the reverse from right to left, crabbing to the left, sprinting on a diagonal, crabbing and then jogging backwards to the starting position. Dewey's and Nymphius 2016 Plyometric Training Plyometric training is a technique used to increase strength and explosiveness. It consists of physical exercises in which muscles exert maximum force at short intervals to increase dynamic performances. In such a training, muscles undergo a rapid elongation followed by an immediate shortening. This is called the stretch shortening contraction, utilising the elastic energy stored during the stretching phase. When warming up for plyometric training, one dangerous overlooked element when it comes to box jumps is technique. For many people, it simply doesn't occur that a freestyle movement such as this would require much technical focus. People just think you can jump on and jump off. Although for others, it can be very difficult to control body positioning and extraneous movement during this type of fast explosive activity, particularly if the aim is to jump as high, fast or as far as possible. Good jumping technique leads to safe and efficient movement patterns, which directly relate to great sporting performance and lower risk of injury. It is also important to be aware that when with fatigue, you are often compromised on form. And so it's wise to stop once you're losing technique, rather than when you're exhausted. Plyometric warm-up. As in any training program, with plyometric exercises should begin with general warm-up. This can be seen by a jog for 1,200 meters, although other warm-ups can include marching, so mimics running movement, so you would emphasize on posture and movement technique. You can also do skipping, so you would exaggerate form of reciprocal upper and lower extremity movements. Emphasize on quick takeoff and landing, which would mimic plyometric exercises. You could also work on footwork, so drills that would target changes of direction, preparation for changes of direction, which would include when plyometric drills, such as shuttle, shuffle, pattern or stride drills. Lunging can also be added based on the forward step lunge exercise, which may be multi-directional, so you can do it forwards or backwards, as seen in the video. So, what is a box jump? A box jump is when you jump onto an elevation from a standstill, although you can just jump. But when you have the elevation, it allows you to measure your progress by increasing it bit by bit. I studied into the effects of plyometric training on football players by Hogurid et al. 2011 and Asadi 2015 found that the enhancement of kicking performance was found due to an increase in explosive strength established by a plyometric training regimen. So why did we choose plyometric training? Due to the multifaceted nature of physical requirements in football, including strength, endurance, power and agility, 
Football training must be able to fulfil the needs of improvement. Taken all together, the data demonstrated a strong ability of plyometric training to transfer and improve specific cardiovascular and neuromuscular fitness. Plyometric training induces the increase of VO2 max, maximal strength, sprinting speed, solid kick, endurance, agility and particular football player skills, also with vertical jump ability. In male and female individuals at any age, whether that be in recreational or professional athletes. In addition, improvements include muscular and tendon strengthening, resulting in the ability to avoid injuries. Hagurud et al. 2011, Asada A. 2015. As seen in the video, Tommy's doing jumps on a box of 30 centimetres. Rather than jumping back off, he is just stepping off the box. This is to assure that he is doing correct technique and is balanced. Reps of between 10 to 12 were performed. This was so that, as explained, he has the volume of an intermediate athlete. We then progressed on to doing jumping on and off the box. As you can see he's using his power through his arms and exploding up onto the box. Although sometimes he was landing on his toes so we corrected that so he landed on his feet. Towards the end we could see that Tom was getting tired so then after 12 repetitions, a rest would be needed. Progressing on from this, we now did double box jumps onto a 15 centimeter box to the floor and then to a 30 centimeter box. Same as with this volume was of what, 12 repetitions and then for a 45 to one minute rest. As you can see in the video, it is an active recovery, so he's not just stood still, he's walking around, keeping the motion going around the room. And then once feeling fully recovered, he would then perform another set. Onto the 15 platform, then to the theatre. This would be done, and then rest would continue. We then progress back onto a higher box, so we now have the platform on 30 centimeters and a 15, so equaling 45 centimeters. He started off by jumping on and then stepping off. Once he was comfortable, he then jumped on and jumped back off. On some of the jumps, you can see that Tommy's going onto his toes, so we corrected his form, so he landed on his feet correctly. How to periodize plyometric training. Because plyometric drills involve maximal efforts to improve anaerobic power, complete and adequate recovery is needed between reps, sets and workouts. So. Proper work to rest ratio is required and specific to the volume and type of drill being performed. Although drills should not be thought of as a cardiorespiratory conditioning exercise but as power training. As Tom has some experience so his class is intermediate, he would have a volume of 100 to 120 repetitions per workout. This can be split between 10 to 12 reps and 10 to 12 sets per workout with the additional of 2 to 3 minutes rest between each working set. Cool down. So why are we doing one? So by doing a cool down as shown in the video, the risk of injury is less. After any aerobic activity, the blood is pulled in extremities and the heart rate is elevated. The purpose of the cool down is to bring the heart rate down to near normal and to get the blood circulating freely back to the heart. Stopping abruptly could result in fainting or place undue stress on the heart. 
Delayed onset muscle soreness, also known as DOMS, is common after intensive exercise and is particularly pronounced the days after unaccustomed eccentric muscle exercise. This would result in when performing other exercises, such as power cleans on other days, you won't be fully recovered. Shun K. Hume P. Maxwell L. 2003